Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to Ask Serena Live. Me and Truett here. Come on in. Hello. Turn this around. Hello, how are you? This is Ask Sarina Live. This is my weekly show that I do on Periscope where I explore a different topic every week. Um, sometimes it's world of work, sometimes it's just general topics, but it happens every week on Thursday at 11 p.m. I want to welcome any replay viewers that I have. Um, thank you for joining me, and if you're new, say hello, um, and thank you for joining as well. So I am Janine Truitt. I am the Chief Innovations Officer for Talent Think Innovations LLC, which is a talent management consulting firm that I own and operate in New York, New York, New York. Um, actually, no, I'm in Long Island, New York, but um, that is my business. So this week, my topic is the rise of the Black female entrepreneur and I find this to be a very interesting topic, obviously because I'm a black entrepreneur myself and it kind of, in a sense, it kind of bothers me to uh, attach a color and or a gender to the aspect of entrepreneurship because an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur, somebody that owns a business or somebody that acquires businesses and makes them great and then sells them, whatever your definition is of it, that's what it is. And so some part of me feels kind of funny attaching a gender and a race to it, but it is what it is. And we're going to kind of go through this whole topic because it's a hot topic. So I wrote a little bit about this. If you want to get to like the actual article that I referenced to kind of um, round out this topic, you can go to the aristocracyofhr.com and I have a direct link back to it and um, you can certainly see all the stats. So let's get into it. What I find fascinating about this, and this was not something that I knew, uh, this is something that I found just kind of in researching different things around entrepreneurship, but um, women in general, so like if we take the whole racial thing away from it. Women in general, since 1997, women-owned businesses have grown 74%. So that's tremendous in and of itself. Black-owned businesses that are owned by women, African-American women, have grown 322% since 1997. So that to me was just mind-blowing. I didn't know it. It's not been something that has been publicized quite a bit. So how would you know unless you go digging for it? But 322%, that's tremendous. So, you know, the question is, and I guess the question that everybody has about this topic is what with the uptick? So let's look at it again. Take it step back from the whole racial piece of it. Um, I think my sense is, is that on the whole, you have this whole topic of women and pay equity issues in the workplace. You have the whole issue of work-life balance in the workplace and uh, not having the same upward mobility as men have in the workplace. So that right there, I think you can attribute to this uptick that we see just in general. That's race aside when you look at black women well you know when you look at just pay equity alone black women and even latinas they're getting it worse than even our white counterparts so pay equity alone right we know that 78 i think women white women get paid 78 cents on the dollar for their white male counterparts and so that's been all the buzz for like at least a year or two now for black women, that is 64 cents on the dollar. And for Latinas, it's 56 cents on the dollar. So if you look at pay, just pay, that right there is enough gumption to say to yourself, you know what? 
I'm not making any money in the corporate world. I'm not making any money doing what everybody told me to do, right? Because in the Black and Latino communities, and, and I'll speak specifically about Black communities, and I know how I grew up, I am a first generation American. And so my parents are from the West Indies and my grandparents were from the West Indies. And the the message you got, and I'm pretty sure this is, there are other people that can attest to this, but this is just my reality. Uh, the message was, you go to school, you get your education, you keep your head down, and you go out there and you look for a job. You get said job, somebody is just so, so great enough to give you a job, you are just grateful. You're so grateful for a job and you take that job and you keep your head down and you do work. And it doesn't have to be enjoyable. It doesn't have to be great. It maybe doesn't even have to be the thing you want to do, but that was the message. And that's what my grandparents did. They came to this country, you know, to seek a better life for the family and essentially you know, they just took the jobs that they can get. I don't know, or I don't have the sense that they were really able to explore what they wanted to do. They didn't have that luxury. And so, you know, when it comes to this whole concept of entrepreneurship and black women in particular, do I think that some of us are realizing our dreams? I think a lot of us are realizing our dreams, but we're realizing our dreams, not from a place of comfort, where you just kind of sat back, you know, and decided one day, I'm gonna go into entrepreneurship. It was more of, I did all the things that my parents told me to do or the things that were ingrained in me. And I went into the workplace and I tried that. I, I picked a profession, I tried that. And, you know, I tried to rise the ranks or, you know, I tried to maintain a job or I was a mom and I decided to have a family and that stagnated me and I had no other choice but to start a business and see how that worked. And so my feeling and I think a lot of the commentary that I'm seeing around is basically saying that, you know, women are basically just saying, give me back my life. You know, you don't want to give me work life balance. No problem. I'll take that back. Uh, you don't want to work with me. You don't have a trajectory for me within your company. You don't see me as somebody in leadership. You can't pay me what I know I'm worth. Uh, I will make it work for myself, good, bad, or indifferent. And so, you know, I don't know that we're all thriving in the same way or, you know, that data is still left to be seen. But I do think that this uptick is because of the ills of the workforce and what companies have been unable to establish in 20, 30 some odd years. So, you know, a lot of times people ask me about whether work-life balance is attainable and I kind of covered the whole parenthood thing two weeks ago. Uh, I think it's attainable to an extent. I think, you know, some days more so than others, but in terms of a company that I can think of that I've worked for or that any of my counterparts have worked for that is extremely on point in terms of making it easy for women to come to work, to rise the ranks, to decide they want to have a family or not and still have some semblance of a career, not so much. You, you almost always find yourself in a situation where you have to choose. It's either you want to rise the ranks and be in leadership or have a career and or if you choose to have a family or something else comes up, whether it's health or you've got to make a choice for that. So hi, Jennifer. Thanks for joining. So, you know, I think that's where we're at and while I'm extremely happy with the decision that I made, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, part of me is like, wow, it's such a simple thing for companies to fix, I think. And yet they've squandered these opportunities. Hey, 
they've squandered these opportunities largely because they refuse to address it or don't see it as enough of a problem, most companies. And, and so I'm not saying that every single company out there isn't willing to do this, but we, I think the companies that are doing it right are the minority. And I think the ones that are not doing it right are the majority. And, you know, I could have just gone with this topic of women owned businesses and women entrepreneurship on the whole. And that would have been something to talk about, but I think it's some, somewhat compelling to talk about this rise of black owned businesses. Like black women own 14% of all businesses nationwide. Now that is still a small chunk of when you think about all of the businesses, but that's a tremendous amount of businesses comparative to years ago. And so, you know, hey babe. <laughs> so, um, that would be my hubby, by the way. So I don't just call random people babe. That's my husband <laughs> that just said hello. Just wanna clear that up. So um, yeah, I, I really just think that um, I, I'm excited for these numbers because it lets me know that women are taking control of their lives and they're, they're not any longer afraid to take a risk. Because uh, let's face it, going into business for yourself is a risk. It is far easier, far easier for you to just report to a job. Hey, Lataria, it's um, far easier for you to report to a company, report to a job, and simply collect a check and go home at five o'clock. It just is. Um, just because people are coming in, let me just reset. So Janine Truitt, Chief Innovations Officer for Town Think Innovations, LLC. Thank you for the hearts. And you're watching Ask Sarina Live and this topic that we're, hey girl, um, the topic we're attacking tonight is the rise of the black female entrepreneur. So um, as I was saying, it is, oh, thank you, hubby. <laughs> so it's far easier, again, to just go work for somebody. It just is. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. And in fact, when I went into business three years ago and then full-time last year going into this year, this is my first year, first full year out, you know, even I didn't anticipate everything that I was going to encounter going into it. I wouldn't change it for the world. It's the best most worthwhile struggle I've ever had in my life. Um, but at the same token, I would be remiss to not share what got me here. Um, so what got me here, and if I go back, and I'm honest, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I am a fresh, green HR professional coming out of school, you know, having come out of an industrial psychology program, basically thinking, I'm gonna be a CHRO in somebody's company someday. And that was what I was gonna do. And I had my first HR job and I was working in recruitment. I worked with pharmaceuticals and so forth and so on. And I just had a ton of ambition. And I went into the companies that I joined with the best of intentions to do the right thing. Like just to show up show out if there was something they needed it was done if there were projects where they needed that were challenging i was like me i mean there was just not much more i could have done to show that i was dedicated to my profession and that i wanted to grow and so you know i i sauntered from job to job to job you know every few years or so and it took me a while to recognize the following, which is that there was no trajectory for me as a black woman. So let me go back again. The companies that I was in, um, those companies, I was very often the only black woman in a division, the only black woman in the company, the only black woman ever <laughs> in that business. And it didn't bother me any because I knew what I was bringing to the table, but it was an affront to others. And many times because of who I was and how I worked and how I approached things, they didn't know what to do with me. There was no place for me. There was no pedigree. There was no box for them to fit me in. And so 
it was very hard for me to rise the ranks. And it's not anything I'm just talking about, you know, subjectively. I would implore you to check out Harvard Business Review. They have a book called Managing Diversity. I believe it came out in 2008 or so, but there are case studies in that that will show you that there is a clear, different trajectory for Black professionals in the workplace. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just giving you my personal experience and I'm giving you something more objective to go look at. And so, you know, it took me a while because at first you're just like, well, you know what, the job just didn't work out. Let me move on, you know, and, and every subsequent job was better than the last. And so, you know, I just kept kind of moving on and, and riding the wave and that kind of thing. But um, in time, you have to sit with yourself and you do have to say, okay, what's going on um i'm performing above standards i'm performing better than many of my counterparts whether they be black or white but i'm performing better i'm a high performer right ambition i have highly visible projects you ask me to do something i do it i go above and beyond my performance evaluations top notch but i'm sitting in i'm sitting here every year i'm sitting here salary here title here and it never gets here right it, it's a steep slope you just keep climbing it but you can't quite get there and so after a while you have to ask yourself what is at play here it's not my performance it's not that I'm not ambitious it's not that I don't come here every day with my eyes wide open ready to work there's something else at play when you start to see other people who don't share my skin color rise in the ranks and so obviously it was you know the latter which is that I was a black female and they hadn't really thought about me and where I belonged or where I fit in the company and so you know this was not just one job this was several jobs of that and when you know I started really having kids and deciding that I wanted to have a family and have a little bit more balance in my life I just realized you know, look, this is this is going to be an uphill battle and you have a lot of things you're ambitious about and you are going to, you know, have to make some hard, fastened decisions about your life and your career. And so I went into business for myself, not from a place of comfort. And so I want to go back to that first point, which is that, you know, I don't think a lot of these women are doing it from a place of comfort where they can, everything is such that they've got to a tight, tightly wound business plan and they've got six months savings and everything's just perfect for them to go into business, they have to go into business because there's no place for them in the workforce. And like, you know, I could come here tonight and I could sugarcoat it so that it doesn't hurt anybody's feelings, but this is real. It's real and it's a fact and it's true and thank you for those hearts, but this is what it is, and I think the sooner that we deal with the facts and the reality of it, the better we are, the better off we will be. Um, I read an article today on Medium by um, somebody by the name of Moishka Mars, and she went into a whole tirade about you know this whole concept of female entrepreneurship just in general and adding all these different demographics to the entrepreneurship title. And, you know, it was well written. It's a great article and I agree with her, um, except I work for a company that can make decisions so I can end it. Correct, right. Yes, yes and yes. There is, absolutely, Lataria, there is just and I've said this on, um, I, I had a webinar series uh, just about two months ago called Honest Diversity Conversations. You can Google it um, when you have a moment. Uh, it was a great series. And I talked about on there how there is a pedigree of black women that many companies want and they don't exist in great abundances. And you must be this kind of black woman in order to rise the ranks. You know, so it's almost like, you know, just be very complacent and be very grateful 
and you know, wait your turn. We want you in leadership. We want you there, Janine. We'll get you there. Just hang in there. Meanwhile, I'm working. I'm working hard. And all these other people who are doing less work than me, they're moving up. They're getting raises. They're getting raises. They don't have to wait their turn. But it's a pedigree. It's like they want you to just be very calm and just understand. And we'll get you there. And now I'm sorry to say, like, I don't need anybody to get me there. I set my rates. I decide when I do business. You know what? When my daughter says, mommy, I don't feel well. I can't. I don't think I should go to school. I say, you know what? Go back to bed. That was something I had to worry about before. I had to worry about, oh, you know, wow. Wow. That's crazy, Lataria. Yeah. Um, you know, no longer do I have to worry about calling my boss and saying, hey, you know, right. Very often the case. Very often the case. And yet, it, you know, I've said, I actually said this not too long ago. There's a rule book for how, yes, it's workplace politics. And, and the thing is, is like, you can't voice that. You can't go there and say, hey, I think there's some foul play here because, you know, I'm busting my tail and it's looking like all these other people that don't look like me are moving up the ranks. You can't say that. You can't say that. Don't dare say that. Don't pull the race card now. They don't want to hear that. But, you know, these are the things. Like, we've gotten into a whole nother thing about workplace politics and trajectories, but I think it's important for people to understand that these are the things that have led greatly to this uptick of 322% increase. Right. These are the things. When you constantly are working and working and working and giving and giving and giving and all you keep getting is a no, hey, how about a, a higher raise than last year? No. How about that promotion? No. <laughs> how about a lateral move? No. So when that happens, you have to make some decisions. You have to make some decisions. And like I said, I don't any longer have to call into somebody and explain to them from A to Z why it is I need to take a day for my daughter when other people in my office were taking off time to go do Christmas shopping. Again, folks that don't look like me, not trying to be racial, I'm just giving you the facts, okay? To take care of my sick child. I was, I'll give you a quick story before I move on. I was once, my my middle child had pneumonia i mean literally we we almost lost her and i was on a very very highly visible project and from the hospital from icu i was on a conference call with my company handling business by her bedside and there was never a promotion there was not a recognition of the fact that I gave up that time that I should have just been focused on praying for my child none of that it was just that's what I'm expected to do nobody else who ever was in any kind of situation like that with their family would ever have to do that but I had to do that so you know it's these things that wear on a soul that wear on a person and at a particular point you have to say you know what I may have to go through some things in starting this business. I may have to cut back. I may have to sacrifice. You know, we may not have a lot of money for a really long time while I'm trying to launch. But you know what? It's better than having to deal with that. And so that's what I think we're looking at. I think that we're seeing it on the whole because I think it's an issue for women in general. But know that if it's an epidemic for women in general, that the black women and other women of color are feeling it 10 times worse. It just, it is, it just is. Um, and you know, it's, I, correct, absolutely. It's like, y'all are made for that. Live that hard a life, go for it. You know, I am happy to say that, you know, a lot of those injustices that I experienced 
It's a different ball game now that I'm the boss, a completely different ball game because I can choose my work and when I want to do it. And in fact, people will try to, you know, get you down on your price. It's a different ball game in entrepreneurship. So now it's like, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, it's a different ball game in entrepreneurship. You know, now the issue is when people don't want to pay you what you're worth, but you know you're worth it and you know the value you provide. So that I've, I've flipped it from just having no, 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 and not having anything I could do about it to now I have to deal with explaining to people that they will have to pay a price that I designate in order to do business with me. And I've had that discussion many a day. In fact, recently I've had that discussion. So, you know, people have a certain sentiment that maybe if you've got business owner A here, black business owner over here, black business owner over here, well, you can get the lesser. Why are you charging so, why are you charging so much? Why? Shouldn't be charging that. Who told you you can charge that? Oh, I told me I can charge that because I know what I provide. So, you know, it's a lot. It's um, same game, different, you know, different flavor. Exactly. Same game. But the difference is, is I have many more things to be thankful for within the scope of my business. I have a lot more freedom, a lot more flexibility. I work a ton of, ton of hours, but the hours that I'm working, I'm working for me. And that's the difference. And, um, you know, I'm just such a fan of any woman that decides to take this leap and do this for their family, whether they're white, black, Latina or whatever, because it's not easy. And like I said, we're not doing it from a place of comfort. We're doing it because we've been made, we've, we've been through things that haven't worked for us. And now we got to try something else. We, society, work, whatever has forced us into this position. And so the only thing we can hope now is whatever we choose to be in business for matters, that we leave a legacy for our families, that um, we can become wealthy, like we can sustain ourselves with it. That's the hope, right? So that's what I've got on this. This is what I've got. And I'm glad that I can get that off. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, um, I don't know how many of you all know about Black Biz Scope, but I was on Black Biz Scope twice now, actually. And I was on last week uh, talking about my holiday promotion. And I swear that community is amazing. I mean, they support Black owned business like it is nobody's business. It is amazing the amount of support. And there are businesses I didn't even know existed. So, for me, with the holiday coming, I am absolutely all over it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, look, we've been entrepreneurs since slave, slave days. You can go back and do your research and see. I just found somebody, um, and I actually used her photo in my blog post. Her name is Biddy Mason, and apparently she was like one of the first African-American entrepreneurs that um, she was almost like a real estate tycoon for her time, but she amassed a fortune of like 300000 back then. Like I'm talking 1800. So, I mean, she was paid and um, she did this out in L.A. And so, you know, this is nothing new. I think of Madam C.J. Walker. You know, she's well spoken about, especially in the West Indies, um, being of West Indian descent. So absolutely. Yes. Yep. Yep. Well, because, I mean, we're one of the biggest, largest consumer segments as well. And so, you know, I, the more that we realize how much power we yield, we will have people eating out of our hands. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, 14% of the segment right now being owned by African-American businesses, me being one of that 14%. I know a slew of women that are sitting in corporate positions right now that are getting ready to launch something. The only reason why they haven't launched is because of either financial constraints, um, either their you know family situations or whatever the case is. But there's a slew of women that I know, at least 10 to 15 that I know, 
that are looking to get out in the next five to 10 years and start their own business. So this is not ending. This is not ending. And yes, Letary, I saw what you said. Definitely have the buying power. So I will end it there. Um, next week's topic is going to be all about the holidays. I'll share with you a little bit about what I'm thinking about with the holidays coming because I'm going to be honest with you. The next week, not next week, but the week after that is Thanksgiving. And I can assure you, I will not be on Periscope on Thanksgiving. I'm trying to eat, drink, be merry, and be one with myself. So <laughs> I think I will be doing some other scopes that week. But next week will be um, my last scope before Thanksgiving. Um, you know, and, and I'll probably do some other fun stuff right before Thanksgiving. But, you know. There has to be a divide somewhere with this social stuff. I love y'all, love Periscope, but Thanksgiving night, I'm going to be drunk as a skunk and eating. I'm just going to be honest. So um, next week, we'll talk about the holidays and what I'm looking at and looking forward to 2016 and what that looks like and what that may look like for you. And um thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lataria, for being on and providing feedback and just vibing with me on this topic tonight thank you hubby for being on thank you jennifer for hopping on and listening thank you so much for the hearts i appreciate it and um like i said if you want to read more about this topic you can go to the aristocracy of and uh this is up right now with links to all of the articles that i use to reference this particular episode and if you are interested in what I do in business, you can also check out talentthinkinnovations.com. That's my baby. That's my movement. That's my black owned business. Let's talk about it. And um, I just wish you a great rest of the week. We hidden into Friday and a great weekend. All right. So thank you. Share this with your friends. And I appreciate you really. Take care. Bye.